uh, will filter in. Um, so thanks very much uh, for coming to this panel, um, which is comparing some of the lessons and, and maybe missed lessons um, in the comparison between uh, nuclear deterrence, which we at least think we learned a lot about during the Cold War, and cyber deterrence in the modern context. And we have a great panel for this. You have their bios, so I'm not going to give you an extended background, but it's a, uh, it's a great cross-section of uh, scholars with extensive policy experience as well. Um, so I'm going to go in alphabetical order, because with this distinguished panel, there's no way to, to judge otherwise. So we'll start Professor Jervis, go to Herb Lynn, and then Professor Nye. So um, hopefully they'll speak for about 10 minutes-ish, ish, and then uh, we'll uh, then open it up for, for discussion and questions, uh, and, and want to leave plenty of time for that. So with that, I'll turn it over to Professor yeah. Jervis. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, I, if I'm less coherent, even less coherent than usual, it's because I have this bad cold. But as you can hear, that has an advantage. It has dropped my voice several octaves, so I sound authoritative. <laughs> so, but don't be misled. Okay. That, <clears throat> you know, this is a topic a lot of us have sort of chewed around the edges of, and uh, I'm not sure any of us have really have a full grasp on it, but, but anyway, for the next nine minutes here is sort of some of my thinking. The first is uh, uh, the good news and the bad news. The good news is, and I'd be interested if either of my colleagues or Austin or anyone in the audience disagrees, the danger posed by cyber strikes me as much less than uh, nuclear weapons. That is, you know, with nuclear weapons, especially, you know, once we grew the stockpile to a reasonable or unreasonable size by the mid-60s, we really are talking about the total destruction of you know, civilizations as we know it, even if the nuclear winter argument was wrong, and I got the people still debate whether it's right or wrong. Um, my understanding leads me to conclude that that just isn't what we're talking about about cyber. I don't mean to say that we wouldn't get our hair must, or at least Herb and I wouldn't get our <laughs> hair must, uh, but uh, it just isn't the same order of magnitude. Um, even I think the worst scenarios are very bad, so I, I don't mean to say we should be complacent, but I just want to remind you that what we were talking about in at least an all-out nuclear war was something that was really pretty incredible, and that isn't the magnitude we have now. That's the good news. The bad news is we'd like, of course, to be able to use, as Austin said, what we learned from nuclear weapons in terms of how, and managing them for managing cyber conflict. And I'm just not sure how much carryover there is. <coughs> That's, of course, the main topic. Oh, where's my watch? Uh, anyway, so, uh, on the one hand, the basic similarity uh, transcends nuclear weapons. And the basic idea of deterrence, which is that we can, all the participants can restrain mutually destructive behavior by you know, threatening to retaliate. And there's a, you know, a world out <coughs> there that's worse for all the players than a more restrained world. And that one can do that by making credible both threats and promises. And there's two things I want to stress. The, the threats, and maybe even the promises, certainly the threats don't have to be anything like 100% credible. That uh, is a nice phrase by a, a British uh, defense minister <coughs> saying that 5% security, 5% credibility is enough to deter an adversary, but 95% may be needed to reassure allies. Uh, the role of, and we see this coming up in the Persian Gulf today in the even nuclear slash non-nuclear context, and I don't think we need to go into the question of reassurance of allies here, at least not yet, but it, it does uh, lead some interesting directions. Which, uh, But I do want to stress the credibility of promises. That is, Schelling pointed out 
very early and stressed, although a number of people missed it, that making a threat credible is no good unless you simultaneously can make credible your promise not to do these nasty things if the other side complies or you know, doesn't do nasty things to you. And I think we may have a real problem with that in the, in the cyber area. But I think that basic logic, I mean, you know, simple enough, you know, is a core we don't want to lose sight of. Okay. With um, <clears throat> nuclear weapons, first thing I just want to stress is there's a lot we, we didn't know at the time and we still don't know. You know. There's a lot of good scholarship by historians and political scientists going back over the record and it looks different than it did 10 years ago and will look different 10 years from now. So, And a lot of what we taught and wrote about for nuclear strategy I think was, is in a certain logical sense right, but did not really describe and explain a lot of actual behavior. Put that down. Okay, nevertheless, <clears throat> okay, uh, several things in nuclear weapons. Not a lot of technical knowledge was needed. You needed to know these things went boom and killed a lot of people, and you did not need to know much of any atomic physics. We were generally talking bilateral U.S.-Soviet, complicated a bit by, of course, the Chinese, and, but essentially we're talking bilateral. Furthermore, all the actors were governmental actors, and that, you know, we were not worried, about, some people worried about someone stealing a bomb, but that was mostly made good movies, but not a real worry. Now, I don't need to tell you that, you know, we're talking non-governmental actors as much as governmental actors. Related, there are not a lot of constructive uses for nuclear weapons. Uh, there are for nuclear power, but peace, you know, PNEs, peaceful nuclear explosives, didn't work not only politically but technically. And we obviously, no, it's just not true for cyber things. Um, next, there is the certainty and what Joe Nye nicely called this, the crystal ball effect, especially after H-bombs, which because the A-bombs aren't big enough to do the job. Once you have H-bombs, everyone knew what a total war would be <coughs> and it was you know, horrible beyond belief. And there were finally, there were fairly clear lines nuclear use and non-nuclear use. And then there were important debates academically and in the policy world about whether limited nuclear wars were possible. Uh, we don't need to go into that, that, but you know, there was a real debate and many of us felt that those wars were not possible. I don't think any of these characteristics hold. And so what we have, I think, with cyber is uh, we still have lots of common interest and varying in different aspects and realms. And Joe Nye's paper that I think was, was circulated to everyone, I hope, or just to us, everyone, is, is just a, you know, really a marvelous tour of this. And it reminds me of what a government official said at the first meeting of this type that I was at that Herb sponsored about three years ago. He said, this stuff makes my brain hurt. <laughs> Right? It is incredibly complicated. <laughs> and I think Joe is right, well, I'll let him speak for himself, he, that there's good news and bad news in that. First, hard to understand, hard to fully get uh, government, any sort of control internationally, but the complexity means there may be bits and pieces that are easier to solve in the sense of develop rules of the road, ways for mutual constraint. It isn't as though we have to solve all of it to solve some of it. And that may be the, one of the most important lessons. Uh, <coughs> another point of <coughs> both difference and similarity is in the nuclear uh, era, we talked a lot about could, what could nuclear weapons deter and debated whether they, the only thing they could deter was nuclear use by the other side position most strongly and I think at the end implausibly argued by my uh, you know, late friend and colleague Ken Waltz. 
And others of us argued, no, no, extended deterrence was possible, extend to allies, extend it to major provocations like large-scale conventional wars. Uh, so there was some discussion of using nuclears to deter non-nuclear things. Now this is much more important, the realm of what's called cross-domain deterrence. Uh, thinking of space, cyber, nuclear, conventional, and even lower level. This is very, very hard. As at one very interesting conference, we had two days, about 15 papers, none of them really tackled it. We all went off in different directions. It's, uh, but it is important. This is not a, a dome, an area that is sealed off. Excuse me. <coughs> Just make three final points because I'm almost out of time and out of my points on my paper anyway. That the confusion here would be very relevant if we get into a cyber crisis. There's some big event aimed not at the heart of America, which is Hollywood, but, you know, but uh, at Washington or the power grid or one of those, where national <coughs> level decisions are called for. And my guess is it'll be like, you know, stirring up ants in an anthill. I mean, everyone running around, uh, but unlike the ants not knowing what to do, because my sense, and Joe knows much more, and maybe even Austin comment from me, that you know, this is very complicated, and the, and the top level knowledge has got to be really limited. I mean, the President, the Secretary of Defense, Secretary of State, and even the level one below, they can't spend hours trying to get their minds around this or thinking what they will do if certain things happen. And I think there would just be tremendous confusion in decision making. Uh, finally, in this way, I'll see where, that <clears throat> one thing carried over from nuclear weapons is does the offense or the defense have the advantage? And I think, again, there's uh, some bad news, but a little good news. Yes, my understanding is for the foreseeable future, offense is easier than defense. That is, a, you know, I've, I've just heard the end of the panel this morning. I've, I couldn't make the other, but. You know, conventional wisdom, which in this case I think is right, is you know you can't get 100 percent protection. You know, the bomber, the, I don't know what, what analogy we use, that the, the cyber bomber always will get through. But in the nuclear area, we, when we said offensive advantage, what we also thought was a big first strike advantage and crisis instability, that is, <laughs> if you worried the other side was going to strike, you would have to first, even if you preferred peace to war, because you were faced with a situation where war was very likely and there was an enormous advantage to getting in first. I'm not sure this is true in cyber. That is, if you worry that the other guy is doing nasty things, I hope, I'm not sure, the incentives to, in a sense, launch a lot of your stuff right away, I think, are less. And that's an important, if true, that's an important measure of uh, stabilizing measure. Yeah. Thanks very much, Bob. Herb. Okay, so you have some uh, view graphs, PowerPoints uh, in front of you. I don't intend to go through all 50 of them here. <laughs> um, but it, I, I really, the, I hope you get to read you know, it's the last 45 of the slides um, because the, I'm really looking for input on this, and my contact information is on, on, on the back of this. The, uh, the, the, the proposition that I want to, 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 to raise uh, is that it is useful to think about um, the cyber through a nuclear lens uh, in, for, for a couple of uh, reasons. But thinking about nuclear issues is, in fact, as Bob said, much more advanced than thinking about cyber issues. And in fact, a lot of former nuclear strategists, I'm one of them, uh, are thinking about cyber conflict today. Um, I'm also a former hacker, so that's why the connection. Um, and, and so the, the question that I ask is, how does the conceptual framework that we built up around nuclear weapons, uh, strategy, operations, acquisition, all that sort of stuff, help us in, in thinking about cyber, given the reality, the fundamental reality, which again, Bob alluded to, that cyber weapons and nuclear weapons are very, very, very different, okay? Um, and so what I, my, my claim is, is that the same questions arise in both domains, but the answers are very, very different. 
Uh, and I just wanted to go through the you know, four, four slides which take a possible question uh, that arises in both domains and suggest how the answers are, in fact, different. But the, the questions are important. And the reason that, the, that it's important to pull out the questions is that when you talk to a nuclear strategist, what he knows and what he talks about uh, is some mix of the questions and answers, and they aren't clearly separated in his mind. Uh, and what I hope to do is to be able to find a way of drawing on the insights of, of, of people who study nuclear conflict uh, a lot uh, to help in, in, cyber, in some systematic way. So the first question that I, I uh, pulled out of my many, I've got you know, a dozen questions for each domain, in, 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 that's the back end of the 45 slides, um, uh, is what's the, nation of, what's the nature of the escalation ladder? Uh, and and uh, we talked about a, uh, an escalation ladder in the, in the nuclear domain. It wasn't, you know, there was a point at which it was just one big bang uh, thing. But, you know, we, then we talked about more graduated options and, 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 and so on. And um, so the idea of how conflict would escalate in nuclear made it, you know, what, what was, was relevant. Um, and, and a couple of observations. In nuclear, it come, nucle nuclear domain, nuclear use comes after its conventional conflict commenced. Very few people seriously thought about this bolt from the blue. I know that was a scenario that people talked about, but nobody really took that seriously. I mean, other stuff was going to be happening. Um, uh, there was also the question of a failure of extended deterrence providing another path to, to, to escalation. Um, going nuclear was escalatory. Right. We all thought, I mean, that, that going nuclear was a terrifying thing. When conventional forces started to get overwhelmed, you'd go nuclear. That was an escalation. Okay. And counter value strikes were at the top of the escalation. If, if all else failed, you'd kill people on, on, on the other side. In cyber, it's a very different, it's a very different uh, world here. Um, cyber comes in the early stages of the conflict. That's what the logic of it suggests. Uh, it's before kinetic war. Uh, maybe it's the prelude to kinetic war, it's the softening, or something like that. But it's, it happens before you see any <laughs> operations at all. Um, in principle, cyber is just another weapon to be used by the US military. The, the, the idea is to try to get it integrated. But it's got this other funny characteristic that it too, and for certain operations, requires NCA, you know, the presidential authority to, to, to do. Um, uh, see the... Uh, reported document, the, the alleged release of the uh, of, of PPD twenty in the Snowden documents. Um, uh, going cyber in in this case is pre-escalatory, right? Because it happens before con uh, conflict. So the escalation ladder goes from cyber conflict to conventional up to nuclear. Okay, um, and counter value strikes against population interests and, and so on happen all the time. They're the bottom. Okay. So on operations, one of the interesting questions that we faced a lot in the nuclear domain was the question of tactical warning, tactical warning and attack assessment. Right? Um, there's a zero background of nuclear detonations going on. Right? There's no noise issue. Once a nuclear weapon goes off, we know that it's gone off. We know where it is. Okay? They're readily identified in time, place, yields, and, and so on. And early warning satellites give you, you know, may, may give you uh, early warning of a strategic threat. We, that is, we see their missiles going off, right? being launched. You get some time to, 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 to warn. In cyber, it's completely different, right? The, there's a constant background level of, of cyber noise that you have to pull out a signal. You don't know whether you're under attack. Um, the effects may be hard to recognize. When my computer gets a blue screen, is that some flaw in Microsoft Windows? Or am I under attack? Who knows? Um, weapons effects manifest themselves in zero time, with zero warning time. Um, and and you know, the, the other thing is that you can easily imagine attacks happening on a large scale not by what I call streaming information flows. That's, not, that's a bad term, but I don't mean a, a real-time attack. I mean that you would imagine a whole bunch of implants in everybody's critical infrastructure systems going off at the same time. Okay? So this is something that they would be planning for, for years and years and years, months and months, however long, uh, and then they'd all go off at once. It's the equivalent of I mean, it's ridiculous to think of in the nuclear context that you would smuggle in, you know, thousands of <coughs> nuclear weapons into the United, hundreds of nuclear weapons in the United States, pre-implant them, 
and then detonate them all at once. That's the analogy, but nobody ever worried about that in the nuclear domain. Maybe they talked about one weapon going off in Washington, DC, but not hundreds of them all over the country. Acquisition. The acquisitions process is a very interesting one. Um, to build a nuclear weapon, you need know-how and nuclear materials, right? Yeah, and, and a huge production complex to, to deal with all the stuff, to make the nuclear materials, to machine them, and, and, and so on. The other thing is that your nuclear strength is a function of numbers, <coughs> that you manufacture a bunch of identical nuclear weapons, and the more of those you have, the stronger you are, at least according to some theories, right? Um, and the, the, the delivery platforms for these nuclear weapons are part of a very, very long DOD acquisition process, decades long in some cases. Right? Cyber is completely different. Right? R&D is the key attribute there. The numbers of different weapons is what counts. Nobody thinks you're stronger in cyberspace because you have one zero-day exploit and you duplicate it off over 100 CD-ROMs. Right? That's ridiculous. If you could do that with nuclear weapons, that would be, you know, that'd be really something. But you can't, you can only do that with, infor you, you can do that with information weapons. And so what you really want is a hundred different hundred CDs with different exploits on them. Now that's something, that, that, that's something else that's very different in that regard. And argument, I would make the argument here that you would want, and some, some DOD writing does seem to suggest this, that you want delivery platforms uh, to be manufactured sort of as, as part of the operations maintenance process, not part of the procurement process. Um, that is, you want stuff to happen in days or, or, or weeks, not, you know, not, really, not really years. Okay. And the last one is arms control. You, you think about limiting, you know, a big deal in arms control is reducing the number of weapons. We want to do that. Nuclear, you know, the salt talks, the start talks, and long history of, of, of all of that. And you think about is there an analogous agreement that you come, could come to in cyberspace? I think you very quickly discover the answer is no. Um, there's no possible way to you know, think about no development or acquisition of those offensive capabilities in cyberspace, right? That's sort of the, the equivalent of, the, of, of that. You can't possibly verify it. Um, you can't limit the number of zero-day vulnerabilities that somebody collects. Um, penetration testing really is the only way to validate defenses, so you have an actual need for those. Um, and there's no government monopoly on any of this stuff, on, on attack technology. So those are the, and then the, the last thing is, is, is that um, this fellow over here wrote a very interesting article in uh, 2012, Strategic Studies Quarterly, trying to understand some of the, what I would call the meta, meta questions <laughs> that come up about uh, similarities between, nu between nuclear and cyber. Um, and you know, one of the questions that, that, that Joe raised in that article, for example, was how, how does technological change affect strategy? Okay. So in the nuclear domain, we, we see a lot of technological change that, 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 that affected strategy. Uh, we were able to, more nuclear materials meant we could go from counter, for, counter value strategies to counter force strategies. Um, uh, we had better and better accuracy so that you could get a, a nuclear warhead within 100 meters of a, of a target and for sure destroy it. Fixed tar all fixed targets became vulnerable. Um, ballistic missile submarines, you, had, you finally had secure second strike capabilities. Um, you know, big deals uh, in the nuclear uh, business. In cyber, there are also techno major technolog technological changes afoot uh, that we need to, to, to consider. Growing user bases in Africa and Asia, um, Internet of Things going on downstairs, um, social networking, cloud and mobile computing. Um, most of the world now accesses the world through mobile computers, you know, hand, handsets. Um, possible quantum computing makes uh, the, the current infrastructure for securing the Internet uh, potentially vulnerable. How we get there, not clear. Many more opportunities for vulnerability and, and lots of noise in, in, in where to, to hide uh, your attacks. Anyway, so that's, those are the ends of, the, <coughs> the end of my talk. There are all sorts of things in here that I wish you would read, uh, and I really would like it if you, if you have other questions that come up that you can think of, um, to send them to me, and, and I'll give you credit in the paper, and, and, we, can, and we can talk about them. I'd, 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 love to, I'd love to hear what you have to say about that. Thanks very much, Herb. Jeff. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to, uh, first of all, I agree with what Bob and Herb have said, so there's not going to be contention, but... Uh, what I'll do is take my 10 minutes and divide it in half. And the first, I'll, I'll 
talk about a couple of lessons that grow out of the paper that Herb mentioned that it was titled Nuclear Lessons for Cyber, uh, but I won't rehearse it all. Um, and then I'll take the second five minutes to talk about deterrence in, uh, uh, in cyber and particularly cross-domain dimensions. Uh, when I wrote this paper of Nuclear Lessons for Cyber, it, it, as Herb points out, everybody would say, oh, the technologies are totally different. Yes. But what's interesting at the meta level is how do states and governments respond when there's a huge disruptive new technology? And that's, a, that's, a, that's something that nuclear and cyber both have in common. So that was the, the purpose. And, and just a, a, I'll just mention a couple of the lessons quickly uh, without running through all of them. One is, is that uh, uh, what you think are lessons early on uh, change as the technology changes. So it would, particularly when you have a volatile technology, what you think you know, you don't know. Um, and in the atomic area or nuclear area, I mean, Bernard Brody did one of the first uh, books to try to make sense of this. And Brody said the main thing is that this stuff is going to be very scarce. Nuclear destructive power is very scarce. <coughs> Therefore, we have to use it on cities. Uh, of course, when the H-bomb came along, that reversed it. I mean, it became totally reversed, and you had a totally different strategy, which is counter value rather than counter, uh, not counter force, rather than counter value. Um, so things we know now that offense dominates defense in cyber, um, I don't know, 10 years from now, I don't know if that'll be true or not. But we can't just, we can't just make the assumption. Um, another lesson is that uh, a, a strategy for new technology often lacks empirical content. The, uh, uh, this is a little less true of cyber than nuclear, but you know, in the early days of, cyber, of nuclear strategy, there was a lot of theology because nobody had any, any empirical content. It's a wonderful uh, uh, quote uh, from Alan Entoven that I repeat in the paper where Entoven and some general in the pen, Entoven was one of McNamara's whiz kids. Entoven and some general were arguing about nuclear war. And finally, Entoven says, General, I've experienced as many nuclear wars as you have. And, you know, the point is that there are things, when we say cyber war, depending on the thresholds, I would, I would agree with Thomas Ridd that we have not yet experienced cyber war. There have been a lot of cyber events of various types, but full-scale cyber war, as opposed to cyber adjuncts to kinetic wars, I, I, don't, I don't think we've seen it. So, so a lot of it is, is like the nuclear. It's, it lacks empirical content. Another thing is that uh, uh, new technologies often raise interesting problems in civil military relations, which take time to work their way through. I mean, this was true in the nuclear area where you had the creation of an atomic energy commission and Eisenhower's international program of Atoms for Peace, which many people later came to re regret uh, in terms of proliferation effects. Uh, but it's even more true in cyber in the sense that 90% or more of the internet is uh, is in the private sector, and so the question of the of the relationship between government and and uh, the uh, uh, private sector is a is another dimension that has to be thought through, and that in terms of moving toward things like arms control, where where Herb ended up, uh, some of the lessons that I drew is it's interesting that uh, learning can occur um, uh, without coordination. In other words, if you look at, at the U.S. and the Soviet Union in the 40s and early 50s, they developed rules of prudence. Don't get into direct fights with each other and so forth without having any arms control process. And uh, another thing that's interesting is that learning is discontinuous and lumpy and slow. You know, it's not a linear uh, process. Um, it's interesting that, that it took uh, about uh, from 1945 to 1963, 18 years before you had an agreement between states, and it was in the what you might call the environmental area, the the limited test ban treaty, and it took another five years to 68 until you got the non-proliferation treaty, and that leads me a third lesson is that maybe when you're thinking about beginning arms control. In cyber, you might say, 
What do you notice about those two things where learning occurred in nuclear, uh, besides that it took about as long uh, in nuclear as where we are in cyber since the takeoff of the, of the searchable web? And that's uh, uh, begin your arms control efforts with positive sum games. And both the limited test ban treaty and the non-proliferation treaty were one a game against nature and the other a game against third parties, which might tell you something about where you'd want to focus first efforts on arms control in, in cyber, for example, cyber crime. Um, anyway, those are some thoughts about lessons from nuclear to, uh, to cyber that uh, uh, are, are, I think, worth thinking about. Now, let me say a couple of words with the, with the time that I have left about uh, deterrence in cyber. Um, first of all, a deterrence uh, ought to be thought of in a cr cross-domain or broader than cyber domain context. If you think about it only inside cyber, computer to computer, you're missing something. Um, so that when we think of deterrence, uh, we often think of nuclear deterrence as based on denial and punishment. Denial is if you have very good defenses, punishment's the obvious one. But there's a third dimension of deterrence, which I think is particularly important in cyber. That's entanglement. Sometimes people will call this self-deterrence, but it is extraordinarily important. If you ask, why have we not seen cyber war? It's partly because we don't know the full collateral effects of what it would be to have a cyber attack. Or did Paul Bracken this morning mentioned in the financial area, why doesn't China dump dollars? He said in war games they don't, but they shorten the time horizon of the yield. But there is a real world example. In 2009, the PLA was angry at the Americans selling uh, uh, arms to Taiwan, and they recommended to the standing committee that China dumped dollars. <laughs> and the Chinese central bank said, not on your life because of the damage it'll do to our economy. So that's self-entanglement. So if you say, why doesn't China bring down the American grid over the Senkakus or Dayu Islands? Well, I think entanglement tells you a lot more than punishment or, 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 or denial. And, but entanglement is, an, is outside the cyber domain. So as you think of deterrence, think of it in a broader context. Similarly, when you look at, uh, at our doctrine, it's interesting that we talk about retaliation, um, but we talk about cross-domain retaliation. The US doctrine is very careful not to say, you hit us with an electron, you're going to get a nasty electron back. No, we say, by means of our choosing. And I think that's important because it gets into some of the very interesting work that Herb is doing about uh, escalation. How do you understand escalation ladders in a cross-domain context? And I think Herb's work is about as, as good as I've seen on that, even though he hasn't got the answer quite yet. But it certainly has pro prodded me to think, uh, think more about it. So again, that's cross-domain. And if we, if we limit ourselves, we're, we're missing some of the most important things. The third point about uh, uh, deterrence in cyber uh, goes to this question of attribution. It's sometimes said that you can't have deterrence in cyber, meaning deterrence by retaliation, because attribution is impossible. Well, attribution isn't impossible. There, in fact, are degrees of attribution. And when you talk to people in the Pentagon about this, um, they will tell you that we're actually considerably better at attribution than people think. It's not that you want to distinguish the attribution which you need for a court of law and the attribution you need for identifying an opponent to the point that you can deter them. And uh, a good example of this would be um, the recent Sony case. Uh, it was intriguing that the, that the US government decided to put the president out front with full faith and credit, if you want, of the US government. After first trying to hide attribution with a statement by FBI Director Comey and so forth, eventually they put the president out front. And you say, well, why would they take that kind of risk? And the answer, as we learned later from a David Sanger story, 
is because we had pretty fully penetrated the North Korean system. We were inside their system. So it wasn't the things that Comey talked about in the beginning or other people debated about as they were sloppy, they used the wrong words, and the, so on and so forth. We actually knew. And there are some systems where we have penetration where we know. In addition, you can supplement what you know electronically with human, human intelligence. Uh, so there's not just one means of getting intelligence for attribution. The net effect of this is that deterrence can work in cyber. Uh, depends on what degree you're talking of, of, of certain you need. In this case, I don't know the answer to this, and this is pure speculation on my part. I think the reason that the administration probably went out front as quickly as they did was because it was North Korea and because of the non-cyber domain implications. Remember in 2010, the North Koreans sank the South Korean frigate Chunan, and then they denied it. And then we set up a special inquiry about was this a North Korean mini-sub that had done it. And they continued to deny it even after the inquiry said yes, it was likely. And the Chinese hid behind the North Korean denial saying that they couldn't punish the North Koreans about this. And the North Koreans, in a sense, got away with it. Um, I think what the United States was doing in the Sony case was saying to the North Koreans, you did this once, you're not going to do it again. And that goes for anything, whether it's cyber domain or non-cyber domain. So knowing that particular government and having the knowledge that we had, which could allow attribution to the level that we did, I think we did choose to spend something, which was the knowledge of our <coughs> penetration of the system. Essentially, we burned a source. But I think the feeling was it was burned for good cause, because in the case of North Korea, it was not just cyber vandalism, as the president said. It was actually a behavior by a regime which thought that it could get away with things. And it was very important to tell them, no, you can't get away with things, either in cyber or in nuclear because we are going to respond. Interesting to note, however, that when it came to the response, which the president would say, said was going to be proportional, first of all, he categorized the action as cyber vandalism, not cyber war, which I think is correct. And then the response was not a cyber response. It was essentially a modest set of sanctions, uh, which is, again, the importance of cross-domain. So as we think about deterrence in cyber, the message of this second five minutes is don't think of it limited to the cyber domain. It's much more complex than that. And if you want to understand what's really going on with cyber deterrence, put in the context, which is cross-domain. Excellent. So I'm going to steal my moderator's privilege and ask a quick question of each of the panelists, and then we'll open it up to the floor. So for Bob, you mentioned the cross-domain aspect, yeah. as did other panelists. Um, if you read the current recently released <coughs> DOD cyber strategy, um, it specifically calls out the need for, to maintain military options against opponents' command and control. Um, that to me, to Herb's points about escalation, casts a shadow over nuclear command and control, yeah. which was always recognized as a vulnerability. And so I wonder what your thoughts are about the potential for unintended escalation to yeah. the nuclear level um, with, with using cyber effects. And that goes to your point about pre-escalatory. It might be thought of as pre-escalatory, but actually quite quickly implicate other things. For Herb, something you and I have talked about, and you mentioned with the, the difference in background noise, is one of the other issues with cyber is that it's difficult to distinguish penetrations for collection versus penetrations yes. for attack. And so I wonder if you'd reflect a little bit on how we might deal with that in a deterrent sense, because in crisis, as you, you and I have talked about before, the need for intelligence goes up, and so the desire to penetrate might go up, but it might be misinterpreted as an escalatory cyber action. And then for Joe, on the attribution piece, which I agree with you 100%, um, we did burn essentially a source in order to get some deterrence value. I wonder if you could reflect a little bit on how policymakers in the future might evaluate that trade-off. I think North Korea was a specific actor where the cost of burning the source might have been relatively low and the value high. But for Russia and China, who are somewhat more sophisticated and it might burn a more, uh, a, a more valuable source, um, it, it might not be worth it. So I wonder if you could reflect just for a minute on, on how future policymakers might evaluate that trade-off. So yeah, <laughs> it's briefly uh, certainly a good point overlaps with, with what 
Herb and a little bit what Joe was saying. Yes, I think that uh, whereas in the nuclear uh, area we worried, we did worry about various accidental sorts of escalation. We worried a lot about the first strike advantages in a, in a crisis, not a bolt out of the blue, but you know, lose it or use it situation. Here, I, th I think you're right in the cyber, the problem is in a way a different aspect of the entanglement, if you would, that, <clears throat> that the things are so knit together. And further, the only point I'd stress is that not only do we not understand that uh, on the other side, I don't think we understand it on our own side because it is so, you know, kind of literally where do these wires lead to? Uh, and uh, so on the one hand, I mean, there, there are three, three hands on this one. Again, we just, although we have a lot of cyber experience, we don't have it at this level. And the real, but would compound the difficulty of decision making when you start doing this. Uh, the second aspect is it may really inhibit people if they know enough at a certain point they might say, you know, I know more about kinetic tools, especially even conventional. I'd, hey, let me, if I drop a bomb there, I have a pretty good idea of what that will do. Let me do that. Uh, and the third, of course, is uh, if they don't think that, you're just going to have a situation that I think uh, be very hard to control. Um, you would ask me the questions. Where I can only state the problem, and you <laughs> stated it pretty clearly, right? So the, the issue here is how do you distinguish between an attack yeah. and an exploitation <coughs> um, uh, for espionage or, or for, for intelligence gathering purposes? Um, that's really hard, and, and you, know, you have to wait uh, until, it, it, until it goes off. Um, uh, some people in this audience I know actually have serious experience in doing this stuff, uh, and, and they will tell you the same thing. Um, so it's, uh, that, that's a, a really tough question. And, and the, the, que the, the other question that you raise is about if you go after the adversary's command and control networks, um, if they, if in the beginning of a conflict, because you want to take down their command and control networks to control their, their planes and, 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 and their ships, are you going to hack in by mistake into a strategic command and control network? And now, and they're not going to have a sign on it that says, do not enter here. Um, and, and that's going to be, a, that, that, that's, that's a mess. Yeah. Um, and we haven't, we haven't thought that through, as far as I can tell, we haven't thought that through at all. The, the answer that I get when I talk to uh, senior decision makers about that is, but they know that we wouldn't do go after be going after their nuclear command and control systems. Are you nuts? We wouldn't do that. that, that, that and seriously, that is the answer that they give, and, and that's not going to be very satisfying to somebody sitting on on, on the other side. Uh, I just want to make one comment about the the, the attribution uh, point, which I, everything which, which that the, the Joe said about that I agree with. In, another, in many other instances, attribution may actually take a much longer time. It may, it may, may take months to figure out who attacked you. Okay? And one of the things which I, I really worry about in thinking about deterrence is, what is do we have an, any understanding of how to deter, how to execute a retaliatory threat that is delayed by months? And what's the, de what's the deterrent value of that? I don't know anybody who's given that serious thought. Um, and that, that's a very interesting question. The only literature I found on that has been in the criminology literature, which of course is not relevant in certain ways because it's individual rather than state. And mostly criminal deterrence doesn't work very well either. So anyway. Could I just say? Yes. Uh, in 1914, I mean, current thinking is if the Austrians had taken action against Serbia right away, Europe would have said okay. It was waiting that made it look very different, look perhaps correctly like a, pl uh, a plot by Germany to take over all of Europe. Waiting hurt. Well, on the question of, of um, when do you burn a source, this, this happens all the time in intelligence. I mean, it, it's, it's not unique to, to cyber. Uh, I suspect that, uh, that you're right, that that when you're dealing with a North Korea, you have less to lose by burning a source than when you're dealing 
let's say, with China. But it, it's also interesting to go back to what I said, that uh, if you have multiple sources, yes. you may not have to burn a particular cyber source. Uh, you can maybe attribute it to something else. In that same vein, it's interesting to notice that um, the role of private sector security firms. In when the U.S. had a, uh, well, put differently, the New York Times was worried about penetration. They hired Kevin Mandia. Um, they got the Mandia report. Uh, Ironically, the U.S. government then later used the Mandiant Report, a private sector intelligence operation, if you want, to uh, bring uh, sanctions against or indictments against five PLA officers. So that's an interplay of governmental and non-governmental. And it may be that, uh, that when you don't want to burn a source, you may find ways to hide behind uh, things that are being done in the private sector independently. You don't have to put them up to it, but, but it gives you a, a type of cover. Um, let me just comment, on, though, on this question of, of command and control, which is, which is very intriguing and what you can do about it. I happen to think that in the arms control area, uh, that there is some promise in the, area, in, the, in the idea of exclusion zones. I mean, if you look at, I mean, the, the simple version of this is we won't hit hospitals and schools. All right, that's you know that you know goes against you know violating the proportionality and discrimination under just war theory and so forth. So that's a no-brainer. Though the question still arises: Do you have enough knowledge of your systems that you know when you're not going to hit a hospital or school? But let's suppose you say that no hospital, schools, uh, and you start there, and you say no nuclear plants, civilian nuclear plants. You might, if you felt that you were getting somewhere on that, you might then go to the power grid, which is dual use, both military and civilian, but you might expand to that. And you might also have a separate agreement, which is we will not attack, make it explicit, we will not attack nuclear command and control systems. And then you say, well, I mean, this goes to Herb's view graph, which says you can't verify it. You can't verify it, but on the other hand, sometimes non-verifiable things create taboos, which can inhibit uh, action. And, and so if you, if you find, I mean, Dick Clark makes this point, that if you find a logic bomb in your grid and you complain about it, and they say, oh, it's for just for exploitation, not attack, uh, well, you know, no, no logic bombs in the grid, period. No logic bombs in in uh, nuclear command and control when you say, well, it's, it's just preparing the battlefield uh, type intelligence. You say, no, this is an area where you don't prepare the battlefield. I think it's not out of the question that you could begin to see exclusions um, which, which could make some normative uh, sense and some constraint, though, it, though there are a lot of problems with it. But, uh, but, so n nuclear command and control would be, would be one I would put high on the list. I, I, in principle, I'd, I'd agree with that. But the problem comes in when the nuclear and the conventional command and control are intermingled. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, if you have a separate nuclear command and control system, absolutely. I, I, you can imagine that, and I would support an agreement to do that. But when they're intermingled, that, that's Which is hard, true of right. space assets. I mean, if, if the same satellite is doing, right. is doing both. So you, you're right. I mean, it, it's not easy. but. You might say, if, if I know that a certain satellite is actually being used for both, I will not attack it. I don't know, but it is, it is complicated. And the final point before I open the floor is what becomes really worrying for me in, in an accidental sense is if in a crisis, a uh, potential adversary expense, experiences command and control problems that are not caused yeah. by cyber right. attack and yet interpret yeah. it that way. Yeah. So suddenly ballistic missile early warning systems go on yeah. the fritz in a crisis mm -hmm. and you think it's a cyber attack when in fact it's not. Okay, um, if you could, when I call on you, would you just briefly introduce yourself? So I'll start with Jason. Okay, yeah, thanks. Uh, Jay Healy from the Atlantic Council. Um, what really is worrying on nuclear is the US, Russia, it's India, Pakistan, and the kind of Iranian nuclear capability to tell Israel not to go into that command control. I mean, it's just not gonna happen. So it's, it's the minor players that worries me more. I'm really happy about it. I love the discussion. And I love 
that sat here came out and talked about the little green men. You know, General Greenlow, we're not fooled by these little green men. The same process that he knew what was happening in Crimea is the same analytical process you go through for attribution. So I hope that having gone through that, we can learn better. And I'd love to go to your point about the, mod the modality. I mean, I think so many of the questions that you're looking at now, Herbert, are confusing because cyber has been so monumentally inconsequential. And in a strategic sense, it hasn't made any difference in a conflict right. that, that I can find. And that's what makes it confusing. If it ever were to start killing people, I think a lot of these, these veils would disappear. Um, but what worries me is that deterrence might be the wrong, the wrong concept to come into. Um, I find the people that I have the most frustrating con discussions with, we'll talk about Sun Tzu or Clausewitz, um, Schelling and when people are quoting Schelling and Kahn, we have a much better conversation. But I'm wondering if we're actually talking about stability in a, in a sense. You know, a lot of the nuclear was about deterrence, was about restraint, mutual restraint, to some degree. And when I have deterrence conversations in D.C., deterrence is an element of superiority. We want to be able to completely do the stuff that we want, and we want the other side to not be able to do what they want. And, and there's some limiting on that. I mean, but but to a significant degree. And so I've really been, been driving in, well, let's look at stability um, rather than deterrence in this. Because we're in a security dilemma, right? We see what the other side's doing. We see that as aggressive. They see what we're doing. They see that as aggressive. <coughs> and, we're, and we're now into this, con this continual um, spiral escalation. And the more, the more we say we need, I've been calling it the, the carpet conjecture, who says we need to be, fe being feared will lead to better national security outcomes. But if you're in a security dilemma, then being feared leads to worse security, national security outcomes. So do we, is you, am I wrong? Is the church really the right way to think of it? Or we need to start getting into some of those other things? And we should talk jurists, not <laughs> and Waltz and others, not, not just when you come. Well, I do think one really big, big, <laughs> big question is, what are we willing to give up? And I don't think that's really been faced. And part of the difficulty in discussing it outside of, a, you know, in, in forums like this, or for most of us, is we don't know what the U.S. is capable of doing, or is doing, or has done. And my understanding is, you know, this stuff is so sensitive, it's just super compartmentalized. And you know, I think that's an enormous problem for even for the people in Washington who have to understand the situation and try to figure out, you know, why, what others have done and why they've done it. Yeah. That they don't know, you know, what we've done. And I don't know, I'd be very interested in Joe, who of course knows this much better than I, if the government is organized in a way that allows for a sensible discussion of what have we been doing? What are we willing to give up? Because the people at the highest levels can't know all the details and get much below that, and it's so fragmented that you can't run the process. Yeah, to some degree, Stuxnet and Snowden both showed what yeah. we were willing to give up, right? I mean, after Stuxnet, we saw, nothing, we saw no reason to, to not do that again. And after Snowden, we yeah. had an opportunity for the president to say, let's stop doing some things. And, and we only saw... And he didn't. Yeah, right, yeah. exactly. I mean, just on the margins a little bit. Yeah, one, there, there, it was quite popular a few years ago to talk about cyber superiority. Mm -hmm. I think that's a, a snare, I mean, a, a, a real misleading concept. But the argument is if you have a strong enough offense, what you can do is deter <coughs> by the threat of your offense. Yeah. And then you also increase your resilience so that you have deterrence as well as, as retaliation and that that will give you uh, overall deterrence. But I think Jay's point, which is, as you know better than anybody, it doesn't produce crisis stability. And so I think, that, I think the, the idea of having talks about things like exclusion of command and control, these are ways to try to get some rules of the road analogous to what the US yeah. and the Soviets did early on, which are designed at crisis stability. And they don't have to be terribly verifiable to have to have that uh, beneficial effect. So I'll, I'll just make a quick remark, um, and this goes to Bob's point about do we actually know what we think we know about the Cold War. Um, 
the U.S. actually didn't really exercise restraint during the Cold War. We said we wanted stability, but if you look at what we actually did, particularly from the late 70s to the end of the Cold War, we strove mightily to hold the Soviet <laughs> deterrent at risk. And Herb mentioned nuclear submarines as a secure second strike. We spent vast sums with great success to hold SSBNs at risk. We spent a lot of money to hold mobile missiles at risk. Even though, it, you're right, at the time we were like, oh, stability is a good thing. But in fact, we worked very hard to make instability, and you know, there's evidence that there was some success. So I don't disagree with you about what the policymaker mindset in DC is. I just don't think it's, I, I think it's more rather than less similar to what we did with, with nuclear forces. And to Bob's point about, about fragmentation, it's very clear uh, that, that it's hard to talk about cyber below the level of, say, the vice chairman of the Joint Chiefs. Um, because most of these programs are so compartmented. I had one war gamer at the Pentagon tell me, we basically treat it as magic fairy dust because we can't <laughs> talk about actual capabilities and programs. And Dick has a two finger on this, so go ahead. Yeah, just to take that point further, I think part of the, uh, part of the problem with uh, all of this analysis is the tradition and academic deterrence theory of assuming uh, a sort of unitary deterrer. Uh, I don't know if this is working. Uh, when part of the problem is there's a certain degree of incoherence and division within the real world establishments involved in all of this. Uh, you know, the question about uh, would anybody be interested in attacking command and control, and Herb said, well, it must be obvious we're not. There'd be plenty of people probably on both sides who say, you bet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and the other, each side, if they're very savvy, will be sensitive to that. I mean, the civilians in the Carter administration who put over the LRTNF decision didn't think the Pershing II was really meant to decapitate Soviet leadership, uh, but it is no accident that the Soviets uh, saw it that way. And with cyber, probably this problem, I imagine, would be aggravated in the sense that uh, there's more of a chance for multiple centers of power in the system to have leverage on all this. Thanks very much. Okay. Sir, introduce yourself. Please. United Nations Counterterrorism Executive Directorate. Um, so my interest is non-state actors. Uh, we heard about deterrence, entanglement. Um, of course, doesn't work with non-state actors. Uh, access to technology, a lot of technology, cyber technology is available for sale, for hire. Um, recently, we saw an attack on a French TV channel, TV5. They were able to take it down for 24 hours. What will prevent them in the future from attacking our critical infrastructures or nuclear plants? Um, your views on that. I can easily imagine a scenario, if you want, where they hire the same, where, where terrorists hire <coughs> the same hackers that the Russian government hires um, to act in, in a manner that is not in, in accord with U.S. interests. I'm getting, so I can certainly imagine that happening. Um, so what, what prevents that? The only thing that I can see that prevents that is a lot of, you know, traditional counterterrorism work about disrupting plots and, you know, doing sting operations, you know, all, 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 that, sort of, all that sort of thing. But the, the problem is when you have very sophisticated hacking services for hire, yeah. um, you decouple the need, you know, the motivation from the, for, for, from the uh, capability. Okay, and now it's just a question of money, um, and, and you know that it, it, it's a big problem. So I, I don't, I don't have a good, I don't know if anybody has a good answer as you know more, more good police work. Can I, I mean three, one is the good news could be that the worry about this could lead to greater international cooperation, both <coughs> to control some of these people and then to you know a basis for other things. And Joe talks a little about that starting with crime on, uh, in, his, in his paper. Uh, the other is, of course, that if terrorists or just acting on their own, a group did bad stuff for whatever reason, and they were a group that had been used by, say, the Russian government, we have a real problem here in is this attack from the Russian government or not. And the third, I mean, which is most far-fetched, but uh, <coughs> It was in the James Bond movie, Catalytic War. We worried about a little in the Cold War, mostly, you know, after two drinks, you know, that really was not, I think, a real worry. And the James Bond movie, which is not bad, I forgot that has the bad guys do this to set up a Chinese-American war, 
it's hard to get the motive going here, but <clears throat> inadvertently you could imagine uh, you know, things that were attacks on one side being misattributed and then leading to international. And in fact, you can you can see that it's most likely in a time when things are already tense between the two nations. Yes, yes, not <coughs> not precipitated yes. out of the yeah, blue, yeah, but yeah. right. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Louise Marie. I'm from Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. And my question is, I already asked it to Herb, uh, Herbert, but I'm going to open up and uh, ask once more. It's related to uh, quantum computing. And as Professor Nye said, um, how do states and governments respond when there's a new technology? So while quantum computing can present several different issues towards cryptography and privacy and how that is going to develop and maybe hear a little bit about what you think that this technological development can bring as threats and as, I don't know, just hear a little bit more. Um. I'll give you the answer that I gave you before, um, which is, is, is that the, the, the um, quantum computing is a technology that is under development now. Uh, the concern, the, the security concern, is that quantum computing will render obsolete the primary methods today of securing the internet um, for electronic commerce and so on. That is, it will dis it will break the current public key encryption system that's available today that enables us to secure our transactions with Amazon or, or, or whatever. Okay. That's the concern. Well, um, it, it, I'm sorry, I just don't, because it, it just allows... Because it, allow, it, it basically, it, it, well, but what it does, what quantum computing does is, is it, essentially it allows the factoring of very large numbers yeah. very quickly uh, in a way that, uh, that right now it's, the technology is based on the fact that it's very, very hard to factor large numbers quickly. Um, and, and quantum computing threatens, if it works, to be able to do that much more quickly. I mean, by much more quickly, I mean many orders of magnitude yeah, more quickly. That's the, that's, that's, the, that's the key. Um, and there are people who bet on whether or not quantum, if and when quantum computing will be uh, a viable possibility. My own personal judgment is more pessimistic than optimistic about that, but I'm easily wrong about that. Um, and, and I think in 15 years it won't be around. But 15 years is not a very long time to, to actually start planning things. Uh, I, th I think, and there is research underway now on alternatives to RSA encryption. Uh, and and that, that's a fairly robust field and, and so on, and people do understand. What they don't know is how to turn that into yet into a viable uh, infrastructure. There's a, a broad infrastructure right now of computing, uh, of, of secure computing that's based, secure communication that's based on RSA. And nobody has any plan at all for deploying a new system uh, uh, about that. I mean, no, there's no transition planning underway that we can tell. So. Um, thanks for all your comments. Actually, just. Oh, sorry, my name is Stacey Elmer. I am a SEPA student for a few more days. Um, and I just wanted to thank you. <laughs> um, I wanted to challenge you a little bit about the assumption that cyber comes in the earliest stages of conflicts. Wondering if that is an assumption because that's how we conceive the use of cyber now, or if we can actually conceive a circumstance where there is a conventional war that is then escalated by the use of cyber. And if that then changes sort of the paradigm it's a, for it's a, sure. deterrence. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's absolutely a fair comment. What I meant by that, and I should have been more precise, what I meant was that cyber will be used in the beginning of a conflict. Whether it be used after, you know, there, you know in the middle, middle and, and so on, I, I think sure, it will be. I'm not, I did not mean to suggest that it would be used only in the middle at, at the beginning. I, I didn't mean to suggest okay. that. So it, with that in mind then, does that change the nature of the deterrence argument in terms of how we conceive of the use of cyber as sort of a escalatory, a stage of escalation. So if 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 it if this might be depend, it, it it might well be cyber might be. What I when I talked about cyber as being pre-escalatory, I was thinking about and in the transition from peace to war. Mm -hmm. 
the, the, this, the latter would go peace, cyber, war. Okay. But now if you want to unpack what war is, there'll be conventional, there'll be, nu there, there'll, there'll be, oh boy, there'll be nuclear, but you know, there'll be cyber in there, there'll be mixes. And in that context, we, I mean, we talked about it a little bit, using cyber to go after command and control networks that might threaten the adversary's nuclear thing could be very escalatory. And we, we, you know, we pro I would say we probably don't want to do that, but. Depends on who you are. Right. Uh, yes, that's. Right. Yes, sir. Hi, my name is uh, Gordon Goldstein, and in prior life I was a SEPA student and a product of the uh, PhD program in International Relations at Columbia. My current life, um, I'm with a, a global technology investment firm, and I recently spent the day with a private sector cybersecurity actor, uh, a firm very much like Mandiant, and I asked about the attribution problem, and I'd like to ask the panelists to respond to this proposition. I asked it, how, how complicated is the attribution problem today, uh, given how sophisticated our capabilities are? And the answer was, it's extraordinarily more complicated with some nation states who have highly developed and sophisticated offensive cyber capabilities, particularly uh, Russia, China, and Iran. And he said the problem, in essence, is not only are they covering their tracks, but they make deliberate and very sophisticated efforts to misdirect attribution to their adversaries. So I'm interested to hear the experts opine on that aspect of the attribution problem in a cyber world where not only can you cover your tracks, but you can misdirect data to implicate another actor. How do we resolve the attribution problem? Steve Bellavin. Bob Jarvis is asking me if you have thoughts on that. <laughs> and you're like, but I, I was just. I yeah, I, 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 I did my. T I, I, I was on my panel already. Uh, no, no, no. We're going to get more yeah, work out of you. The uh, attribution is a continuum. Uh, <laughs> I think the most important thing to remember about attribution that too many purely technical cyber people miss is that it's not a purely technical problem. You right. don't just look exactly. at IP addresses, you look at patterns, you look at uh, techniques, you look at other sources of intelligence that you can bring to bear on what's going on. And uh, if you don't take that larger view, you're not going to get the right answer. Uh, Unfortunately, the other sources of intelligence part is the kind that's most sensitive, hardest to uh, use publicly, uh, especially in an era when people distrust what is coming out of more or less every government worldwide. So, uh, you know, people can hold a mental view that the NSA has penetrated every router on the planet and look at every bit of internet traffic. So, but we don't believe them we, that when they say, we saw this coming from this country. So take your choice. So let, 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 let me build on what Steve said there, because the, the, the point that he makes is absolutely central to understanding attribution. It's an all-source problem. <coughs> it's not just a technical issue. If you just look at the forensics, the, you know, the bits um, from a computer that's been attacked, and all you look at is just the information from that attack, I dare say attributes are going to be damn near impossible. I mean, I don't think, you know, it's just out of the blue. There's some funny stuff there, and I can't, and I'm not allowed to reference anything else. Okay? Yes, that's hard. But once you start looking at historical patterns, once you start thinking, you know, using your spies and your signals intelligence and so on, you get a better idea. By the way, I now, th this particular insight was very useful to me in talking to some PLA people were technical. And you know, you know how the Chinese government always says, you can't do any attribution in cyberspace? They, they just say it flatly. And I, I think I'm now starting to understand why they, why they say that. It's because their technical people think of it as just a technical problem. That's what you expect. They're, and they, you know, they told me, we don't know about intelligence. We just know about the, you know, we just know about the computers. They, they were open about that. And so you can imagine a bureaucratic process in which the, the guys at the top send a question down and says, can you do it? The answer is no. Okay? And you know, somebody has to integrate the answer into, to, take, you know, to take into account many, many different things. And I confess, 
I was once one of those technical people who didn't understand attribution, you know, the, the intelligence aspects of it. And I said the same thing. You can't do it because I didn't understand how intelligence works. And, and so that, you know, so I'm trying to you know, I don't think that the Chinese view on this is, is um, overly, you know, I think that they actually believe that. They don't understand the, 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 the process, but I think that some of them actually believe that. And I would just say two things and then we need to close. One, it, it, it is important um, to understand this is one of the big differences between state and non-state actors is states, particularly the United States, have this other panoply of intelligence resources to draw on that both private sector actors and even smaller governments don't. So that's a that's a big difference, um, and then, you know, the other is, uh, you know, you really have to to think about the the all source problem as the answer. And when you sort of get to that point, echoing Herb, um, Russia and China are a harder problem because they're not only in more sophisticated in, in the cyber realm, but they're in many cases more sophisticated in the general counterintelligence realm. And so that makes the problem harder in in two ways. Okay, well, thank you very much. We, I, we could probably talk more, but I know Professor Nye needs to go, so just a round of applause.